Hi everyone, my name is Barbara. I'm a postdoc in Cincy Danny's Public Criminology Group. I've been with CUC for more than six years now, seven. So basically, uh, from the start of um, her lab here in Oxford, um, she moved back from Thailand in 2015. <coughs> and after that, we set up her lab at the Peter Manor Building for Pathogen Research. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to all of our group members. Some of them are here today and already heard from three of our equal students. Um, so we recently uh, hired a new postdoc, Marta, who's joined us from Ethiopia. Uh, then Jenny is our project manager, Priyanka, our research assistant. And then we have six very talented uh, equal students in the group. Tom, who is probably going to submit his thesis on Friday this week. Um, Ali, who's just started his fourth year, and Sandra and Isabel who just started their second year, and then Yanni and Sana were in the first year, and Sana just joined us this week. Actually, she hasn't even officially started now on that yet, so she'll start on Monday, but is using today as an opportunity to just get to know what everyone else is doing um, here. And Jay, who is visiting us for half a year uh, from Thailand, and who's working with one of our long uh, standing collaborators there. Before I tell you a bit more about our research, I thought I'll just give you a bit of an insight into what life in the lab looks like. And we had some nice lab photographs taken recently. And basically, we are dealing with human samples on a daily basis, which means isolating immune cells from blood of patients, but also healthy volunteers, and processing the blood to also extract serum and plasma for storage and further downstream assays. And this just gives you a bit of a taste of how it looks like in the lab. And when we're not tackling scientific challenges, we're usually troubleshooting freezers and making sure that we have enough space to store all of these precious samples. So now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the research that we're doing. Uh, really what we're doing, the core of what we're doing revolves around uh, people who are vulnerable to infections and more severe outcomes from infections. Uh, so we've termed this vaccines for the vulnerable because at the center of this are really people with chronic metabolic disease, for instance, having type 2 diabetes or obesity, but also the aging population who have some sort of immune dysfunction that predisposes them then to get more uh, likely to be infected with different pathogens um, more frequently. And then also they might have more severe outcomes from infection or they might not react as efficiently to a vaccine as you would expect from a healthy individual. And around this, we're studying two different infectious diseases. One of them here is neglected tropical, neglect, neglect tropical disease. And uh, Susie has been working on, on this for more than 10 years now. And on the other hand, we have COVID-19, which is, of course, as you all know, very recent, but uh, really important. But if you look at the, uh, the funding for those two, um, it's actually not quite so bad for many doses, which is a ne neglected, neglected problem, because it's not even on the WHO list for neglected. But of, of course, COVID, as you would all imagine, attracts much more funding. So it just highlights how tricky it can be to work with the neglected like public disease. Um, but we are fortunate to have um, lots of uh, support for these projects. And I'm going to uh, walk you through all of these in the next slide. So I'll start with meliodosis because that's what we've been working on longest. Uh, Melidosis is caused by the gram negative intracellular bacterium Procodrilus or not. So, the malay is soil dwelling, it's also a tier one pathogen, so it's considered a bioterrorist threat as well. Uh, it's an accident, uh, humans are an accidental cause, basically. So, it enters the human body through cuts, cutaneous uh, infection, or for inhalation or ingestion. It, meliodosis is very prevalent in Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, so basically in the tropics. And uh, we can see a very high mortality rate, and it's up to 40% uh, in some regions of Thailand, Northeast Thailand. Uh, there is a very defined at risk population, so people who get the infection and are admitted to hospital will either have diabetes, renal disease, alcohol abuse, they might be on steroids, or they are very old. 
So uh, diabetes, as I said, is a risk factor, and there is a powerful increased risk uh, for getting many doses if you have type 2 diabetes. And this is only threefold in the case of TB. Uh, there is not enough data on how many cases of melidosis we have worldwide because there is a discrepancy between um, labs picking up the, um, the bacterium and reporting of the cases. But it's predicted that there are around 89,000 deaths per year worldwide, which is more than dengue. And uh, interestingly, so what the, this, this graph here shows you is that the endemic regions really overlap with the highest prevalence of diabetes worldwide. And especially um, if you look at these countries, like low middle income countries, which are of course uh, really affected by this. And most importantly, there's no vaccine available. So basically, this disease is created by antibiotics, but we don't have preventative measures yet. And this is something we would like to change. And given that more than 50% of people who are admitted to hospital with melidosis have diabetes, a vaccine really has to be targeted at this population. Um, before we think about vaccine development, but also including treatments for the disease, we really need to understand more about the correlates of protection in melidosis. And so this is a summary slide of what our group has done over the past 10 years, really. And uh, obviously, this is also supported by many other researchers uh, who are uh, studying amyodosis. And so what you can see is on the left side, uh, we have uh, immune cells or immune features that are increased in people who survive from the disease. And then on the right, uh, top, you see uh, the things that are increasing in people who die. So what we see is that T cells on the left and interprogramma production by T cells, which is crucial to um, high infection, uh, like intracellular infection, like uh, the one caused by Bucodonia uh, Sudamale, they are increased uh, in people who survive. And then uh, innate immune cells are increased like in K cells that can kill infected cells, which is really critical to contain infection as well as activated in the immune cells, like the breeding cells and monocytes, which are important to present antigens to T cells and educate those T cells to generate memory responses. And then antibodies are really important. IgG2 has been shown to be a higher in people who survive. And of course, antibody-mediated phagocytosis of bacteria and inhibition of bacterial growth in uh, cells is increased in the people who survive. And then in people who die, we can see that uh, they have increased uh, levels of certain cytokines, about 15 and now 18, which we would consider as for inflammatory cytokines. But then also L10, which is very anti inflammatory cytokine, uh, the dampened sound immune response is also highly increased. And certain genetic traits like HLA types are also enriched in people who die. And we've also seen that innate immune cells like neutrophils, either high or low levels, are associated with that. Now, this summary slide is a really lovely slide that Pam has generated for his thesis, and it just highlights how important it is that you have a very well regulated immune response in order to tackle infection and for the host to survive this. So, what we want from an infection, uh, from, from a not from infection, but what we want when, uh, from the body when it fights an infection is a very well balanced sequence of events and well timed sequence of events, basically inducing inflammation in the first place uh, for cells to come into the site of infection, then uh, kill bacteria or viruses. Uh, it's a very general thing. So, any pathogen basically, and then bringing more cells, uh, different cells to exert their um, effective functions in order to reduce the pathogen burden. And then you want induction of resolution. So you want this to stop and then you want healing to be induced. So any tissue damage will then be healed. And uh, what Tom has shown here in a blood transcriptomic signature associated with mortality is that you get this prolonged inflammation on the top here. So these are all the things that are elevated, highly elevated in people who do not survive melidosis. So there's prolonged inflammation 
and then obviously lead it eventually to orbit failure and death. But then on the other hand, um, of the blue down here, you can see that there's also high uh, levels of anti-inflammatory responses, basically acting against uh, inflammatory responses that are not able to contain uh, pathogen burden. And so both of these are elevators in people who die and then eventually, um, oh, so, and then this is eventually uh, leads to that. Something else we are really interested in as well is uh, whether certain anti-diabetic drugs um, have um, potentially uh, um, are associated with favorable, uh, favorable outcome in many doses. And so we've looked at metformin treatment because this is a very widely used anti-diabetic drug. And within our cohorts that we had for acute metadosis, we uh, categorized uh, people with diabetes into three groups. Those who already had pre-existing diabetes at the time of enrollment, and uh, those were then split up into people who were taking metformin or those who were not taking metformin. And so on the... Yes. So the left bar here is the uh, number of patients who were not on metformin and had pre-existing diabetes. And in the brown, you see the people who survived, and in the gray, the people who died. So you can see 33% of people in that group died. And then if we look at the metformin group here, you can see only 9% died. And what's also interesting, <coughs> you can see that much less people were actually on metformin in our cohort here. And the ones with, pre uh, with no pre-existing diabetes diagnosis were basically diagnosed at enrollment or at hospital admission, also had a similar uh, frequency of, of death compared to the no metformin group. So when we uh, put this into a logistic regression model, and, if you're, and this is only taking into account the people who uh, were already diagnosed with diabetes at the moment, so pre-existing diabetes, sorry, uh, and uh, correct this for <clears throat> different compounding factors like age, history of brain impairment, and uh, blood glucose levels. Then we can see that this is a there's a significant uh, advantage of taking metformin. So metformin treatment is associated with favorable outcome from many doses. So significantly less likely to die in people who take metformin than they get uh, in uh, and they got many doses. And interestingly, uh, there seems to be a bit of a difference in based on uh, sex. So women um, seem to be uh, um, there seems to be more favorable. Outcome in women than men, but this might be a bit underpowered, but it was an interesting observation. So now I would like to tell you a bit about the uh, world's first clinical trial for the Lucis vaccine, which is led by Susie here in Oxford. And we're really proud to do this because, as I said, there's no vaccine available and we just need to get started. And we have to um, just uh, pave the way for our other groups as well to uh, put more candidates in more vaccine candidates in people and to test them. So what we are doing here is this is in collaboration with colleagues in, uh, at the University of Nevada in Reno, and they have developed a vaccine for many doses, which has shown really a good, great efficacy in preclinical mouse models, 100% efficacy. And basically they are using a conjugate uh, vaccine, which is um, composed of the uh, two components of the bacterium. One is the CPS, the capsular polysaccharide, and one is HCP1 protein, which is part of the type 6 secretion system. So that's a little like structure that the bacterium uses to enter cells and infect cells. And so what has been shown is that CPS really induces antibodies and HCP1 protein induces T cells, a T cell memory. And that's really what we want. We want the combination of both antibodies and T cells. For our vaccine. So the phase one trial, so that, and also to mention that the vaccine is currently in manufacture, so it will be available towards the end of next year. So that means the phase one trial will start in 2023, and these are the different groups that we will look at. 
So the stage one is basically the dose escalation study, and we're looking at the individual components of the vaccine separately. So there will be 12 participants, and then four each will receive different doses of the CPS components. And in the stage two, four of each, um, four participants in each group will receive different doses of the protein component, HCP1. And then in the third stage, uh, the entire product, the entire vaccine will be given to 12 healthy individuals. And the next stage will be to give this to the volunteers with type 2 diabetes to see how their immune response um, is, uh, looks like towards the vaccine. And we'll have, this is just a timeline for the vaccine and, uh, you know, three vaccinations and followed by different <coughs> follow-up time points and we'll follow the volunteers um, up uh, to 12 months post their third dose. And this study um, will be driven by Jenny, Marta, and Priyanka. In addition to this, we are also collaborating with our colleagues at Moro and um, up in Northeast Thailand, Uman Rajitani at the hospital, uh, who will who are running a study of attitudes to many doses vaccination and clinical trials. So this is really important as a preparation for any clinical trial or phase two trial, vaccine trials in the region where we want to test the, the vaccines in the endemic population. And uh, the study will involve uh, different groups of people, diabetes patients, of course, meningosis patients, caregivers, at risk, people at risk of, of occupational exposure, and key informants. And there will be a series of interviews and focus groups in order to better understand the awareness of meningosis, understand um, increase the understanding of infection risk, uh, improving standard infection risk, and uh, figure out what the concerns about vaccines are, um, as well as looking at uh, views of people to participate in trials. Okay, so now I'm going to move uh, to a different infectious disease, uh, COVID-19, and we've already heard a bit about the Pitch Consortium by Isabel and Sandra this morning. So uh, the Pitch Consortium is really an extension of the large MVP siren study, which is looking at more than 40,000 healthcare workers and looking at antibody responses and vaccine efficacy between people. But Pitch is more targeted at cellular responses to the vaccine. And uh, to date, it includes more than 2,000 healthcare workers already. It is a, a collaboration, a national collaboration, and uh, prospective longitudinal cohorts are recruited at five different sites. Uh, Oxford is one of them, and then Liverpool, Sheffield, Birmingham, and Newcastle, as well as Confucian by UK HSA. So the question that the Pitch Consortium wants to answer are the following. Does previous infection impact on response to vaccination? Uh, does the immune response differ between uh, Pfizer delivered in the long versus short dosing interval? And this has already led to um, to inform national policy and basically led to um, the UK government implementing the longer dosing interval for uh, Pfizer. And then how long do, do the responses last? And what happens if our if we encounter different variants of concern, especially Omicron and any future variants of concern. And so the figure that I'm showing here that's uh, taken from uh, the most recent work uh, within the Pitch Consortium, uh, follow, longitudinally following uh, the vaccine responses, T cell, B cell, and antibody responses uh, of these healthcare worker cohorts and splitting these people up into naive and those with hybrid immunity. And when we say hybrid immunity, we mean that they were either, either infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 prior to their first vaccine dose or any time after the second dose. And you can appreciate probably based on your own experience that the native group is one that's going to shrink substantially over the years. Um, so what we can see in black are the people who are naive and in green, uh, in, in red, uh, people with hybrid immunity and uh, there's definitely at the start of the first dose, you can see that there is an advantage of 
having been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so there is a high antibody response here and the T cells are higher up here. But then uh, people who have been previously naive to SARS-CoV-2, they catch up. And what is interesting to see with the antibodies, they are very effective versus the T cell. They, they almost seem to follow a very oscillating pattern here. So they are high once you receive your vaccine, they go down again, and then they're boosted up again, they go down and boosted even further. And uh, this is less pronounced when you've had um, previous infection already. And for the T cells, they basically do not decline uh, or just marginally decline after after a dose of vaccination over time, but then they are boosted a bit and uh, just increase slightly. And then there seems to be uh, some sort of plateau effect as well. And for the variants of concern, we've shown and others have shown that uh, in response to Omicron, our antibodies are less efficient in binding to. Um, uh, to the uh, Omicron variant, whereas uh, T cells are less affected by uh, Omicron, so there's still recognition of the virus. Of the virus. We're also involved in a study called Vibrant, which is looking at the identification of risk factors for vaccine breakthrough infection uh, using SARI and Fitch consortia, and so this is a co PI on this as well. And this is basically using uh, all vaccine breakthrough cases involved in SIREN, and they will be invited to complete an online questionnaire to find more, find out more about uh, possible reasons why they uh, were more prone to uh, get infected or not. And then there'll be uh, a subset of these people who will be studied in more detail in immunological studies. And uh, something that we're really excited about is uh, a new study that we're starting this October. Uh, this is in collaboration with Professor Tan Levan at Opro, and it is called Seco Variants. So it's looking at, um, it's basically a um, Southeast Asia initiative to combat SARS CoV 2 variants. There are four sites in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, and they will work together with researchers in the UK like us and the USA. And the objective is to really enable locally led investigators, uh, investigations into new variants, including evaluating the impact on antibody and T cell responses in Southeast Asian populations, and of course, clinical consequences of infection. And what this next um, slide here ties in nicely with is uh, new international uh, COVID collaboration because our lab is at the heart of our lab is really um, a lot of teaching and capacity development. And um, we do regularly um, work together with all of our international collaborators to share protocols, to train people. People are coming to our lab, obviously less so in the past two years with the pandemic, but it's just restarting now, uh, but obviously remotely as well. So we try to support them, especially labs who are not regularly running T cell immunity in the lab. So we're trying to help them set up the, um, the capacity to actually run some of immunology locally. And uh, this involves a lot of um, SOP sharing, protocol training, but also help with data analysis and interpretation. And I've just put this lovely photo here, um, up, which is uh, Priyanka, the third on the left, our, our agent who went out to Vietnam in the summer for two weeks and uh, very successfully trained staff over there in how to run T cell antibodies. And finally, just the last bit I would like to share with you something else we're interested in is in all of this, uh, we would like to understand more at a basic uh, level what really uh, makes these new cells of uh, people who are more um, susceptible to infection um, dysfunctional. So, what we're looking at is um, basically the um, dysfunction of the cell's metabolism. So uh, we are trying to investigate whether cells from people with diabetes or people who have been infected or people who are old, they, uh, whether they are using different um, 
I'm sorry, that was that's wrong. So whether their ability to generate energy is different, and basically that has an impact on their function. And we're using different methods to do this. I'm not going to go into detail <coughs> what they are exactly, but we've also established a small uh, research facility with two instruments that's accessible for uh, researchers across the university, but also um, for international collaborations. And this is, very, this is this is looking at how cells produce energy. And it's called a seahorse instrument, and it's very uh, exciting. And uh, this is also Ali Chase and Ali's research interests. And we're also doing some single cell RNA seq currently, which Ali is leading on to look at uh, differences in people with diabetes and without diabetes and see whether we can tease out any, any insights there. <clears throat> 